Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third webinar in the Joint Transit Webinar Series, which will cover a couple of different research projects, all related to innovative approaches to characterize asphalt binders and mixtures. My name is Chris Melson, and I'm the Program Manager of Transit, which is Region 6's University Transportation Center, or UTC. This webinar is generally hosted by us, but also Region 8's uh, UTC, which is the Mountain Plains Consortium, as well as the Center for Transportation Research at the University of Texas at Austin. I do ask if the attendees are uh, interested in transit research, really any of the research by the two other institutions, feel free to visit their website and also uh, Transit's website. So today we'll have three 20-minute presentations and we'll save questions until the end of all the three presentations for a quick 10 to 20-minute uh, Q&A. Without uh, further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ruzba Gabchi. Gabchi is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at South Dakota State University. His research interests include pavement engineering, innovative transportation infrastructure materials, environmentally friendly pavement technologies, pavement performance, and asphalt materials. Prior to joining South Dakota State University in 2016, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Oklahoma, working as a PI and co-PI on several research projects run by the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, the Southern Plains Transportation Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality. So please go ahead, uh, Ruzba. Thank you, Chris, for introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a research project that uh, we conducted at South Dakota State University as a part of a project funded by uh, MPC. So the findings of this project uh, uh, are partially are being reported here in this presentation. So uh, the title of my presentation is Screening of Asphalt Mixes for Moisture Damage Using Conventional and Alternative Approaches. <clears throat> So as a quick background, uh, there are several types of the pavement stresses in the asphalt uh, materials, such as fatigue cracking, rotting, uh, thermal cracking, bleeding, potholes, and stripping. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to cover the stripping, which is the, the bounding of the asphalt binder from aggregate or cohesive failure of the asphalt binder in presence of water. So Stripping may occur at different parts of the asphalt pavement and may cause different modes of failure. So uh, in this picture, uh, I'm showing some uh, failure at the surface of the pavement due to the stripping and also some at the bottom of the pavement, also some alligator cracking and cracking in the rotted area under moisture induced damage are shown in a couple of pictures. So, as we discussed, the loss of adhesion uh, between the aggregate and binder, uh, in addition to the loss of cohesion between the asphalt binder and, uh, and by itself, can cause uh, stripping. And as a result of stripping, we get uh, reduction in the strength and the durability of the asphalt mixes. And of course, moisture is always available to the pavement through the penetration, uh, through uh, interconnected air voids or crack or shoulder edge, contraction joints, capillary action, water table rise, upward ground water flow, and other mechanisms. The moisture-induced damage is a very complex phenomenon which uh, is both as a result of physical, mechanical, and chemical action uh, between the asphalt binder and aggregate. So there are several factors affecting the moisture-induced damage in an asphalt pavement. Uh, w one of them is mineralogy of the aggregate, physical, chemical, and mechanical properties of the aggregate, and also the properties of the asphalt binder, which uh, includes the chemical composition of the asphalt binder, and according to the source of the asphalt binder, and what type of additives that we use in the asphalt binder, this chemistry is changing drastically. And all of these are going to affect the adhesion of the asphalt binder to aggregate and its own cohesion. So with different chemistries of the asphalt binder and aggregate, uh, the interaction of the binder aggregates start to change uh, according to this cohesion. So we need to make sure that we are using some materials that are chemically, physically, and mechanically uh, compatible with each other. 
on top of these uh, parameters, as well as these properties such as person air void, distribution of the air void, and interconnectivity of the air void and permeability have uh, effects on moisture induced damage, loading, and then the climate are other parameters that are needed to be considered. Regarding moisture induced damage mechanism, uh, many studies have been conducted to, to, to find out about the underlying mechanism uh, for the moisture induced damage. Uh, one of the very uh, fundamental approaches is the wettability of the asphalt binder and aggregate by water, which was studied by uh, several researchers uh, and in order to measure the wettability and also the bonding and uh, bonding potential and unbounding potential in presence of the water one of the very much mechanistic approaches is use of the surface free energy uh, although the surface free energy is excellent approach and a very mechanistic approach for uh, evaluation of the moisture induced damage between the aggregate and asphalt binder, but uh, special skills and equipment and a lot of time is required in order to conduct this test. So it is more of a research caliber test and not every department of transportation and uh, asphalt design uh, asphalt design lab have this equipment. That's why other test methods which are uh, mechanistic are needed in order to evaluate the moisture induced damage. So why we need to study the moisture induced damage? Uh, of course, there are la several laboratory methods that are out there for evaluation of the moisture induced damage, but based on the type of the test methods, they are very much variable uh, in the results. And the standard methods in some cases have not shown good correlation with the field observations. Also, the very popular test method, uh, which is ASHTO T283 tensile strength ratio or the TSR test, does not necessarily represent the failure mechanism that happens in the field as a result of moisture induced damage. Additionally, the standard method, which uh, in this case I'm, I'm talking about TSR, was developed when not many of new asphalt uh, additives uh, were developed and used by the asphalt industry. Other test methods that are used for the mix and asphalt finder are modified DSR test, uh, DSR test, direct tension test, uh, dry wet dynamic modulus test, and other tests that are used. And literature review shows that not all of these tests generate the same ranking of the asphalt mixes in terms of moisture induced damage. So the challenge here that we are trying to uh, look at, and uh, to some extent we try to address it, was to come up with a quick and expensive mechanistic method or evaluate the existing uh, mechanistic method uh, for evaluation of the moisture induced damage that can be easily used by mixed design uh, laboratories. So in this study, the mixes and asphalt binders and aggregates that we have evaluated were collected from the state of South Dakota which are, uh, and lots of asphalt binders also that are available in South Dakota are available in the upper Midwest region as well. Therefore, the objectives of this study was to characterize the moisture induced damage potential of asphalt mixes in South Dakota and evaluate the effect of using uh, different types of additives such as warm mixed asphalt, anti-stripping agent, and uh, reclaimed asphalt pavement on moisture induced damage potential of the mixes and evaluate the moisture induced damage potential of the asphalt binder and aggregate systems using the BBS test or the binder bound strand tester. Also, uh, we try to study the feasibility of applying alternative test methods to evaluate moisture induced damage potential in asphalt mix. So, there are several researches available out there uh, in the literature that have tried to address the moisture induced damage and look at the effect of different parameters on moisture induced damage. So if I want to give very quick summary about those parameters, many people have studied the asphalt mix properties that uh, change, uh, mechanical properties of asphalt mixes that change with the moisture induced damage. Also the effect of the anti stripping agent or ASA on asphalt mixes were studied with, by several researchers. 
uh, and these ASA additives were uh, lime or amine-based anti-spring agents or other chemicals used as the ASA in the asphalt mixes. Also, effects of addition of RAP uh, have been uh, evaluated in the literature on the moisture-induced damage, uh, as well as the effect of different warming asphalt additives, effect of aggregates, and the effect of different binder types, including the uh, polymer modified or non-polymer modified, and of course the sources of them. However, although the lots of research has been done, every research according to the type of the test that was used and the type of the standard that was used generates different results. In this study, uh, we looked at different asphalt mix uh, performance and asphalt pointed aggregate systems using two tracks of testing. One track of testing only was conducted on the asphalt mix, and the second track was conducted on asphalt binder and aggregate system. As asphalt mix, we collected three different types of asphalt mixes from South Dakota construction projects, so all the mixes were uh, field mixes, so they were collected and brought to the lab. The first one was the hot mix asphalt with one person hydrated line. Second type of mix was uh, asphalt, uh, HMA with 20% wrap, and the third mix was a warm mix asphalt containing 0.5% of warm mix asphalt additive. The warm mix asphalt additive used here was uh, an amine based uh, warm mix asphalt additive. So the asphalt mixes were compacted in the lab to 7% plus minus 0.5% air void, and in direct tensile strength test in dry and moisture conditions. Uh, modes were conducted on the asphalt mixes. Uh, so the ITS test, uh, after we got the results of the ITS test, so we did two different types of the analysis according to the literature and calculated the fatigue, fatigue index uh, on, on, on those mixes and also toughness index on those mixes. The TSR test was conducted according to the ASHTO T283, and also we conducted semicircular bend test in dry and moisture condition uh, states on the mixes. So in terms of the asphalt binder aggregate testing, we collect the asphalt binder aggregate and additives. Asphalt binders included PG58 minus 28, 64 minus 22, 64 minus 34, and 70 minus 28, all collected from a local material supplier in South Dakota. And the aggregates that we tested were granite, gravel, and quartzite collected from Brookings and Sioux Falls at South Dakota. And additives were warm mix asphalt additives, uh, ASA, and also RAF binder. The RAF binder that we used was PAV aged binder uh, from PG58 minus 28. So we didn't want to use uh, extracted binder in order to avoid effect of chemicals that are used in the in those type of binds in, the, in that type of extraction. So after material preparation, we conducted the binder bound strength tester using a PATI device, and uh, we looked at the results for the moisture condition and uh, dry sample. So this is a summary of the materials that we used. The asphalt mixes that we used, the, uh, they, the first two, which was the HMA with lime and uh, chemical warm mix asphalt, they had base binder of PG64 minus 34 asphalt binder, and the HMA with wrap contained PG58 minus 28 asphalt binder. All the mixes were of half an inch uh, nominal maximum aggregate size. So this is a picture of the asphalt mix uh, collection effort. Uh, one of them were from the I-90 project, that was interstate overlaying project, and the others were other projects in the area. So we collected three different types of aggregates. Uh, including quartzite, granite, and gravel from the Sioux Falls and Brookings. Also, asphalt binders all were collected from the same material supplier, and we also collected the chemical amine-based ASA and chemical amine-based WMA additive, uh, as well as uh, laboratory-simulated wrap using the PAV aging method. So the STB and TSR samples were prepared in the lab, and compacted to 7% uh, plus minus 0.5 air void. And also, uh, 
On top of that, we conducted moisture conditioning uh, on STB and CSR samples. We, we followed the H2T283 for moisture conditioning of the STB samples as well. And then we uh, conducted the TSR test and IDT test uh, in the lab. And also on the IDT uh, test samples, uh, we followed uh, some uh, findings in the literature that uh, included calculation of the toughness index and fatigue index after uh, conducting the test. So after having the uh, stress and strain curves, we calculated the toughness index and fatigue index. Also, we used uh, semicircular band tests or STB tests according to ASTM D8044 according to the Louisiana method. So in this method, we use three different notch depths, including 25.4, 31.75, and at 31.8 and 38.1 millimeter notch depth. So after that, we calculated the critical strain energy release rate or the G integral for each test. Of course, we conducted this on a dry sample and moisture condition sample altogether. The next uh, is just the preparation of the aggregate samples for VBS test. Uh, so we cut the aggregates, uh, then uh, prepare the surface by cleaning it. We follow the uh, procedure for that. And also, uh, we finally put the asphalt finder on top of the aggregate and put the stub on top of it. Also, we use a mechanism in order to maintain the thickness of the asphalt, find, uh, the thickness of the asphalt finder under the stub. So we use very small uh, steel balls under the stub that we can maintain the uh, distance of the stub from the surface of the aggregate, and then we conducted the BBS test using the uh, PACI device. And this is a picture of the moisture conditioning of the samples keeping the sample at 25 degrees for 24 hours uh, in the water. At the end of the testing, uh, we, did an, we did a very quick analysis to find out how much of the uh, failure is adhesive and how much of it is cohesive failure uh, to, to also identify the mode of the failure after and before the moisture damage. So uh, as results and discussion, the first uh, graph shows the uh, CSR test results, so for the unconditioned and moisture conditioned samples. Overall, all the samples that we conducted the test on uh, had the CSR values above 0.8, which means that they passed the requirement according to ASHA T283 and the state uh, requirement for the moisture damage. And the lime, uh, lime treated material was found that uh, after moisture conditioning, it shows a higher tensile strength uh, and giving the TSR value of more than one. The second uh, test that we did was also IDT test, but we calculated the toughness index, and uh, we divided the toughness index of the moisture, damp moisture condition to the dry condition sample and got the toughness index ratio. So, and this is the toughness index ratio that uh, was found. Interestingly, the toughness index of the moisture condition sample for those containing wrap and warmix as well were slightly higher than that of the dry condition sample. But it, it did not necessarily follow the uh, TSR test results. It, it ranked the mixes in reverse order compared to the TSR results. The next uh, analysis conducted on the IDT test was fatigue index ratio. So the fatigue index ratio also uh, did not show uh, correlation uh, in terms of the ranking of the mixes with the TSR method. Uh, however, it showed reverse ranking uh, with the, the, the TIR method, actually, toughness index ratio method. So here is a summary of the STB test results uh, on different samples. Uh, for moisture conditioned and the dry conditioned samples. As you can see, uh, starting with a very lower value, 1.19 for the lime treated material, then a big jump for the hot, hot mix asphalt containing wrap, 
and also almost the same result with the HMA with line for the warm mix of bulb. So interesting point was that after moisture conditioning, the STB uh, G integral was increasing, and in all cases, so it means it seems like the sample is uh, becoming more uh, absorbs more energy during the fracture. So here is a summary of the possible correlations between different parameters for the mix. On the left hand side uh, is the dry sample, and the right hand side uh, you can see the moisture condition sample. So in many cases, uh, J-integral and ICS results were uh, showing good correlation, almost good correlation in dry condition, moisture condition, condition, and also the fatigue index with the ITS results showed uh, pretty much good correlation in both moisture condition and dry condition. Also, uh, next slide shows the ratio and the correlation between different ratios of, uh, of the toughness index and fatigue index and also TSR values. So here is the summary of the BBS test. Uh, as you can see, uh, this, this test was conducted on gravel. And uh, starting with the neat asphalt binder, and after adding wrap, the pull-off strength ratio, which is the ratio between the moisture condition and dry condition, start to drop slightly. But after adding the warm asphalt for PT58 minus 28, we see drastical change and uh, it, it, the ratio increased drastically. Also, after adding the anti agent, this was found to be the case. However, for PG64 minus 22 asphalt binder, uh, the change in the uh, pull-off strength ratio, or PSR, was not as uh, pronounced. But for the rest of the samples, for PG64 minus 34 and PG70 minus 28 with gravel, those changes were more significant. On the bottom, you can see the uh, failure type. Uh, so after adding the ASA, the failure type moves from the adhesive to cohesive for the moisture condition sample. And uh, that is also the same thing happens for PG64-34 when the gravel aggregate was used. Here is the test result with the quartzite. Uh, also, the uh, trend were similar, but the effect of the WMA and ASA for all the asphalt binders except PT70-28 were more pronounced on the quartzite type of the aggregate. And uh, for PT70-28, however, those ratios were not as high when the ASA was used. And the last graph shows the effect of different types of additives and wrap when the granite aggregate was used with different types of the asphalt binders. And it was found that uh, the ASA was the most effective when 64 minus 34 uh, binder was used. But for the rest of the cases, the ASA was not as effective. So it can be first uh, the use of granite that was not, uh, uh, but did not generate lots of higher values for the ratio when the granite was used and also the effect of the polymer modified asphalt binder. Also, it should be noted that in some cases, we cannot say if it is the polymer modified or it is PPA modified. So maybe there are cases that it is acid modified, PPA modified, which causes some uh, uh, production of some salt in, after adding the amine-based antispring agent and warm polarity that cause inverse effect. So in order to uh, summarize the findings of this presentation for the asphalt mixes, uh, those containing lime and wrap and bar mix asphalt, there was, uh, they were found not to be susceptible to moisture-induced damage for the mixes that we studied here in. Also, the energy-based parameter were found not to be very well correlated with each other except for the STB and TIR finding. For the asphalt binders, binder aggregate combination with the highest moisture-induced damage, were PG58-28 with 20% wrap and granite aggregate. And the failure mechanism in this case was 100% adhesive. This is something that was also confirmed with the SFE testing from the literature. Also, the, the lowest moisture-induced damage was found to 
uh, B with the PG64 minus 34 binder with 0.5% ASA and uh, 58 minus 28 with 0.5% WMA additive with granite and gravel respectively. And in these cases, the failure mechanism were also 99% uh, adhesive. And as the last page of the presentation, so our asphalt binder aggregate systems, when they were studied, the binder blends containing 20% wrap, uh, increased adhesion when PG64 minus 34 with quartzite and PG70 minus 28 with the granite was used. And also binder blends containing 0.5% ASA, it was found that for all combination of the 58 minus 28 and 64 minus 34 with gravel and quartzite resulted in an increase in the adhesion. However, that was not the case when the granite was used all the time. Binder blends containing 0.5% dark bar mix asphalt additive increased adhesion with both PG58 minus 28 and 64 minus 22 and also 70 minus 28 aggregate with gravel, quartzite, and granite. So, if I want to summarize the recommendations, uh, we found out that the PSR values obtained from the BBS testing uh, were less than 0.8 in all aggregates with neat binders, except for 58 minus 28 with granite and 70 minus 28 binder with granite. And also, the findings of the BBS testing are in general in agreement with those from the SFE test results. Therefore, uh, adding these findings up, uh, we may need to do more study, including SFE measurements side by side with the BBS testing in order to look at exactly the same aggregate and asphalt binder to see if there is a good, good correlation between the SFE and findings of the BBS that it can be a candidate as a moisture-induced damage test during the asphalt binder, asphalt mix uh, design. So uh, I would like to acknowledge Mr. Rajan Acharya, which was my graduate student, very active in conducting this research. Uh, MPC for funding, Ingevity, Balls Construction, and Jebro Company for uh, donation of the materials, and other people which help us in conducting this research. Okay, thank you. Oh, great, yeah, thank you very much, Ruzba. And our next uh, presentation will be from Zahid, Zahid Hussain. Uh, Dr. Hussain has 15 years of experience in diversified teaching and scholastic activities. His teaching and research focus has been analyzing and developing sustainable geotechnical and transportation materials and technologies through fundamental science and applied approaches. Regarding transportation materials, Dr. Sain has conducted applied research in developing and characterizing novel concrete and asphalt materials using recycling and nanoscience technologies. Dr. Sain received multiple awards, including a Ralph including Ralph E. Powell Jr. Faculty Enhancement Award, Arkansas State Faculty Award for Scholarship, and University Transportation Center Award for his outstanding contributions in transportation research, professional service, and academic excellence. Okay, thank you. Um, today, um, I'm going to uh, share some of uh, the experimental data uh, based on a couple of research projects. Uh, they are funded by uh, Transit uh, University Transportation Center. And uh, the topic, it is like alternative of uh, PZ class test to characterize modified binder. So the uh, main objectives of these, these studies were uh, to find or uh, recommend a test method that would uh, be alternative to PZ class test. And uh, specifically, um, we have uh, we had uh, three objectives. First, uh, to evaluate uh, RDOT certified binders, uh, that is Arkansas Department of Transportation certified binders, uh, by following uh, alternative techniques. Uh, we, uh, I'm going to share uh, today only uh, elastic recovery, DSR, and MSCR data, but uh, for these projects, uh, we have uh, conducted tests for other techniques like LAS, linear amplitude sweep test, frequency sweep, uh, as well as binder yield energy, but today I'm going to focus on ERDSR and uh, MASCAR or MSCR, multiple stress creep recovery. And um, also uh, we are going to share uh, some of the findings from chemical analysis. Mostly we'll be focusing on uh, SAR analysis and FTIR 
and then we'll make uh, some kind of uh, recommendation what would be the simple technique or uh, the requirement uh, to implement uh, the recommended techniques. As we know that uh, PZ plus test, there are uh, several of them. Um, they are required for a modified binder, especially polymer modified. And uh, elastic recovery is one of the main test techniques that is being followed by different DOTs, including R dot. And um, uh, force ductility is another one, but R dot uh, lib, they do not use um, uh, force ductility, but uh, Louisiana DOTD uses force ductility technique. Technique and then other uh, PZ plus test, um, uh, toughness, tenacity, uh, and all of them they have ASTO or ASTM standards that are listed on this slide. Um, but the problem is that uh, all of these PZ plus tests they are empirical in nature. Um, they are not based on any kind of mechanistic performance, and they take a lot of time and. Uh, especially for sample preparation and uh, do the test. Doing the test does not take much time, but it's, it is like a um, tedious process to prepare the sample and set it up, uh, get the temperature equilibrium, all kinds of things. And definitely it is a uh, different kind of equipment that is needed, uh, but most of the DOTs, they may have, uh, let's say uh, that um, elastic recovery uh, equipment, uh, um, and um, another problem is that the specification and test procedure, they are different. They vary from state to state. Um, it, uh, it could be aging conditions. One state could be using unaged binder. Another state could be using uh, that uh, the person recovery. So one state may have 40%, another state may have 50%. So there is, like, there is no such kind of like a common consensus. Uh, it is kind of like, uh, local or source level properties. So uh, that's why um, the, uh, the target is that we will find, see if something else that can be done. Um, so elastic recovery, as we know that that is S2T301. So it is a, like a uh, briquette sample. So it is pulled over and uh, it is done at, uh, test is done at 25 degrees Celsius in a water bath. Uh, uh, testing time, it is a little bit of an hour, but it takes several hours to set it up, prepare the sample. Uh, so what it is, it is like briquette sample, then it is pulling apart, and then um, after five minutes, uh, we see, uh, like, uh, we cut it, and then measure that how much gap is there, and from there, we find out the elastic recovery. It is very simple uh, math, and uh, technique is very simple, uh, but the problem is that it is done at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius temperature, and uh, it, is, uh, it is an empirical technique, but it cannot be, uh, many researchers say that it cannot be used to characterize the binder at high performance temperature. The high performance temperature that we are talking about, uh, uh, like PZ64 minus 22, so that would be 64 degrees Celsius temperature, but this, uh, this recovery technique, elastic recovery technique, uh, this is procedure is done at 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, here uh, on this slide, I'm showing what is that pertinent uh, specification for R dot. Uh, so it says that uh, for PZ, I, I have uh, underlined um, the sentence uh, related to elastic recovery. So it is for 70 minus 22, and 76 minus 22 binders, uh, minimum elongation recovery is 40 and 50% respectively. And we, in Arkansas, uh, only three PZ binders are certified to be used, approved to be used, 64 minus 22, 70 minus 22, and 76 minus 22. Um, so that is the requirement here. Uh, and the next slide, it is showing like which states um, that follow the PZ plus test. And if we look at the map, we can see that the uh, uh, majority of our uh, neighboring states, they use uh, PZ plus test. But some states, they used alternative approach as well. For example, um, multiple stress recovery. Uh, Oklahoma has moved into, uh, they, they, uh, they, uh, they are doing in parallel now. Uh, both uh, elastic recovery and uh, MSCR. Uh, the similar case, I believe they are going to go for full implementation in Louisiana pretty soon if, if they have not. Uh, 
Uh, same thing for it is for Texas, uh, Kansas, Missouri, Tennessee. Um, uh, but um, Arkansas has not um, uh, thought much about that multiple stress recovery test method, how to adopt and implement it. So uh, advantage of some of the DSR-based tests, so all the other alternatives that we have today to test methods, they are DSR-based, dynamic shear rheometer, and majority, or if not all, transportation agencies, they have a DSR machine. So there is no kind of additional cost, um, rather than it will be some kind of a training and learning curve. And uh, another good, ad another advantage is that it is easy and it saves a lot of time. And uh, people have reported uh, good repeatability and reproducibility between among uh, different labs. And sample, yeah, only a small uh, amount of because we, yeah, it, it uses only like 25 millimeter uh, diameter sample and one millimeter thickness. So very small amount of sample is needed. Rather than elastic recovery, you need significant amount of binder sample. Uh, and another thing is that this is um, uh, these DSR based tests are based on mechanistic approach. So first, of what is MSCR? And MSCR it is usually performed on RTFO aged binder, and it is um, uh, it has uh, ten cycle for a stress level, and the test is done at two stress level. Uh, that is typical, but people for research purpose people have done at different higher stress level like 10 kPa, but 0.1 kPa and 3.2 kPa, uh, these are the two stress level, and each stress level that it is one second loading time followed by nine second rest period, which kind of simulates the traffic on the roadway. And uh, there are uh, several parameters that are calculated or estimated uh, once this test is done, but Two main parameters they are used for a specification. One is the compliance, so that is that uh, uh, resilient uh, the residual strain that left in the binder, so that is JNR. And another one is uh, MSCR percent recovery, so that is like how much the sample returned to its previous shape. Um, so these are the two parameters used for uh, grading purpose as well as uh, finding or thing like if it meets the specification. Here is a snapshot, uh, it has a Google map. So it shows like who has implemented MSCR or who has fully implemented or partially implemented or have thought about it. And this uh, Google map, it is kind of not recent, three years ago. So something may have changed. So if uh, I do not offer to offend anyone, but that could be uh, kind of like uh, honest error. Uh, so uh, what we see here, as of my understanding, is that our uh, Arkansas DOT um, have not uh, done any kind of extensive research or any kind of uh, study to see um, MSCR can be MSCR test can be implemented. So that was the primary motivation of uh, doing this study. And we can see that uh, Oklahoma, they have, uh, um, uh, they are going to the design. They were planning to do it full implementation in 12 months, but by this time they may have implemented it. Uh, Louisiana, the same case. And then um, Texas, they have partially, they have planned for partial implementation. So color coding is shown. So it looks like yeah, Mississippi and Arkansas, these are the two neighboring states. Uh, uh, we do not have uh, any activity uh, that is available in the public domain that are, I, I am aware of. Um, and there are several groups, they are advocating. Uh, so all these uh, um, user producer group, Northeast, Southeast, North Central, uh, all of all the groups, they have some initiative and their Asphalt Institute is another uh, agency that is trying hard to uh, get the message out. Um, and for this uh, MSCR test, we, um, for that project, we tested binders from, uh, uh, mostly it is from Arkansas and Texas, but today I'm going to show only the data for the uh, for Arkansas. Um, and uh, we pretty much, we went to all the uh, suppliers and did collected uh, elastic recovery test data from the suppliers, uh, and then we, we did uh, MSCR test in our lab, 
and uh, we collected all the samples that we have locations that are shown in the map even though there are some places that they are out of arkansas but they are the supplier uh, for arkansas so that's why you see some out of state suppliers and the next thing what we did uh, we uh, plotted we saw like how the data comes in like elastic recovery percent uh, versus uh, multiple stress recovery uh, percent and that is at higher stress level at 2 3.2 kpa um, even though elastic recovery uh, the requirement is that for pg 70 minus 22 binder it is 40 percent and 76 minus 22 binder it is 50 percent we targeted we looked into see what if um, like if, if we come up with a specification uh, instead of following that uh, very low um, elastic recovery or very highly re high elastic recovery if we can come up with a specification so that nobody is getting hurt neither supplier or nor uh, the producer so that's why you looked at like where the cluster are 70 minus 28 binder so we see that even the requirement is 40 percent but lab data we see like the minimum they are supplying all the binders that is 65 percent that is the elastic recovery that that they are doing it today they are supplying it today so if we can come up with the criteria based on that that way producer will be happy at the same time supplier uh, i'm sorry producer and as well as the user uh, agency uh, uh, producer uh, would be happy same time it is the user they will be happy because nobody is penalized so it is like from uh, supplier perspective like yeah we are we are going to do the same way we have been doing but it is a different kind of test technique that will be used for quality control purpose so from there for 65 percent that is the lowest elastic recovery that the supplier is supplying binder and we found that corresponding multiple stress recovery that is 30 percent and then for 76 minus 22 binder, uh, that is 80%, that is uh, about 80%, one, except that one, some, one supplier is uh, not made, but 80%, that is what we thought, okay, this is what you are supplying. So corresponding MSCR percent recovery would be 60%. So that is how we came up with this. And then, that, uh, then we have another, it is uh, JNR value, the same way we plotted them, and we found that the corresponding JNR, so that would be the minimum JNR, and that would be there, uh, the, the supplier would be um, maintaining, and their binder should satisfy that. So that is again 70 minus 22 binder, it is 0.8 um, uh, kilopascal inverse, and then for 76 minus 22, it is uh, 0.4, at least point, uh, yeah, it should not be more than 0.4, it could be less than that. Um, so that is how the JNR criteria is. Then also we did what would be kind of based on JNR and uh, on the MSCR grading. And as we know that uh, there are uh, four categories based on traffic, uh, standard, heavy, very heavy, and extreme. And uh, the data sample that we tested and we can see that, that the curve that is showing, if, the, if any point that plots above the curve, so that is uh, that means like it has the polymer. If something goes below that, that means it does not have um, required the polymer. And based on that criteria, JNR criteria, we grade the binder according to the MSCR grading. So there will be new kind of grading system for MSCR, and that can be established based on these criteria. And then, so first on, so that was for 70, to, first slide, this slide, it was for 70 minus 22 binder. And if we categorize them, if we test the binder at 64 degrees Celsius temperature, then the, all the binder we have tested, there are uh, some of them, yeah, more, majority of them, it is extreme. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, it is going to be, um, yeah, it is uh, extreme, some of them extreme, then very heavy and then there are some of them like a standard and heavy for 76 minus 22 binders so that is pretty much majority most of them they are in extreme except that one supplier they could not meet the criteria so that is the one that i showed earlier as well 
And then here is another, uh, uh, the next slide. It is, we are showing that how many percentage of binder, what is the grade of that binder that, so for 70 minus 22 binder, that is the top chart, it shows that the tested binder that we had, 56% um, was categorized as 64E extreme minus 22. And then 44% uh, was very heavy. So that is 64V uh, minus 22. So that is like makes 100%. Now the MSCR test was also done at 70 degree higher temperature, 70 degrees Celsius temperature. And if we do grading that time, we see like all these uh, 70 extreme, very heavy, and then standard, all these things, then 23%, 33%, 22%, and 22%. These are the number of supply. 22. They, the, or the binders, they came up with that kind of MSCI grading. So the top graph, even though it has like six bars, but the first two bars, those were, if the sample were tested at 64 degrees Celsius temperature, and the next four, they were, the sample were tested at 70 degrees Celsius temperature. That's why we have PZ70. Um, and the next, the, 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 the chart below that, that is for 76 minus 22. And as we can see, like 100% of the binder was characterized at, as 64E extreme minus 22. And then uh, we have 70 minus 22, 70 minus 22, that kind of category, and also 76 minus 22 category. This is where how we can see like how many percentage of uh, binders made that kind of grading. And then this is a quadrant plot. This is also, uh, uh, this was introduced by Asphalt Institute. So we plotted them, you see like four quadrants. Uh, the first quadrant that is failed, so everyone is like uh, nobody. It does not meet any anybody's criteria. This fail, and um, then on the bottom right, so it fails MSCR, but it meets um, elastic recovery. And then on the top left, so that is MSCR is met, but uh, MSCR meets, but percent recovery does not. So and but on the very top right corner, that is where both MSCR and percent recovery is met. So that is the quadrant where nobody is penalized. Everybody, both, both parties are happy. Uh, supplier is happy as well as user. User means the agency is happy. Uh, so we see like all the binders, they were plotted. That is as of currently, if they supply, if they do what they are doing today and the supplier, then they will meet this criteria and everybody happy. The same thing for 76 minus 22 binder that is on the other side, except one supplier, all of them, all the other binders, they met the criteria. So this is how we can come up with another kind of a specification uh, there. And then elastic recovery DSR test, this is another test technique. So that is uh, done in on uh, eight millimeter plate and that's, this test is done at 25 degrees Celsius temperature and loading time two minutes and recovery time 30 minutes and the sample is loaded at share rate of 2.3 percent um so that is up to a strain level is 278 percent and then there is an equation elastic recovery so that is you can see that the highest strain um yeah share strain divided by how much it is recovered so there how much it is recovered so from there the ratio that the, the two ratios that you can find out the elastic recovery and then we also try to look into what is kind of relationship between uh, elastic recovery and ERDSR, RTFOS recovery. And again, from for 60 to those two binders, two PZ binders, we found that 40% ERDSR is appropriate. For 76 minus 22, it is 60% is appropriate. And then, uh, Another thing that we found out that DSR-based test result, yeah, we can do it, we can get elastic recovery for polymer-modified binder, but there are some suppliers, they may be supplying some binder, they are not using polymer, rather than use acid, for example, PPA. Um, so PPA, it does not have much elastic recovery. We get very, very low, sometimes no elastic recovery at all, or no recovery. 
So how do you characterize this binder? Um, so then definitely these DSR-based MSCR or ER DSR are not applicable. So we need to look for some chemical analysis and see what can be done for acid-modified binder. Uh, and for that purpose, we did limited amount of uh, study, and this is um, yeah, and this was mainly focused on in the data we came and got it is from a previous um, uh, grant from Arkansas DOT, and then there we uh, tried uh, polymer mod um, a PPA modified binder. So we had two. You followed two sources. We uh, tried uh, with two sources of binder. One is Canadian, and another is uh, uh, Arabian crude source. And we made the PPA modified 70 minus 22 binder, as well as PPA in addition to SBA 76 minus 22 binder, to see if we can do some tests. And we did um, uh, this pH measurement uh, using a pH meter, and then uh, we looked into the binder and we saw that yeah, if this is acidic binder or basic binder, we can see from pH measurement we can easily find out. So that means like so from source two that we had that is kind of on the acidic and nasal that is on the right side and the left side that is less acidic from pH value. And then also did uh, SARA analysis uh, according to ASTM standards. So first we uh, we dissolved in inhabitant, then we, uh, we separated asphalt in followed by saturates, aromatics and resin. And then also, uh, yeah, uh, then we do the rota vapor, we use, the, we use the rota vapor to separate the other, all these three components based on their molecular weight. So then we plotted and see if there is any kind of relationship between these uh, chemical families. And we have found that, uh, uh, yes, there are some kind of changes in the, in the para components with aging um, uh, between RTFO as well as PAB aging. And one thing that we found that definitely that saturate content decreased after aging. Uh, since saturate content decreased, so that is the oil. So if this get decreases due to aging, that is when you get like all these kind of a cracking, fatty cracking because the oil is gone due to aging. That aging it is could be at the plant as well as at service temper at the service condition. So um, another thing we found that uh, with the PPA, if we have the PPA, then we have this higher kind of asphaltin content for, yeah, it is source specific properties. That is one thing um, we found. Uh, that is obvious because binder properties uh, varies from source to source. And then also we did like if it is stable, one thing, one parameter that we use that is called gestal index. So that is considering saturates and asphaltin and aromics, uh, aromatics and resins. And what it is, like it tells like a stability. There are some kind of stability, if it's lower limit, upper limit. If we go outside that uh, boundary, then means like we are not having good stability, colloidal stability. So uh, we found that after PAB aging, uh, some of the binders lost their colloidal stability. So that means they are not stable anymore, they are unstable. And then it, that's, that is why it makes the binder brittle. That is the indication of brittleness. And so, yeah, Sarah, so we found that the Sarah analysis can be used as uh, another kind of a test, but this is a kind of a tedious and uh, expensive test. Um, then other thing we did, FTIR test. Um, I'm, I'm going to go very quick here because it um, looks like I'm running out of time. So FTIR test, we also did, there are kind of like, um, in this case, we calculated based on some kind of functional groups, and then we looked into like whether we can um, differentiate any peak for PPA. We found we find for SBS, but so far we have not been able to find any specific peak for PPA in the FTIR test results. So that is another kind of outstanding issue. And one of my graduate students, uh, he is uh, here in the audience, and he is doing his uh, thesis on that, uh, we'll try to see if we can find it. Um, and um, so that is, uh, yes, I'm going to go quickly. The conclusion is that, uh, yes, we can use both you know, either ES, ER DSR or MSCR uh, test as a replacement of um, the elastic recovery test. 
and I have mentioned like uh, what would be that criteria, acceptance criteria for year DSR 64, uh, 70 minus 22 binder, it would be 40%, 76 minus 22, it would be 60%. For MSCR, it would be 70 minus 22, 30%, and for 76 minus 22, it would be 60% recovery. And we can use that um, uh, the chart or the criteria a JNR criteria to uh, grade the binder according to the MSCR grading. And from, um, uh, from, for the acid modified binder, one quick thing that agency can do is to run pH test. That will give an indication of the presence of PPA. Uh, and SAR analysis or FTIR analysis, FTIR we cannot recommend for uh, PPA modified binder yet because we do not know the peak. But SAR analysis can it can be used for kind of fatigue performance or other things based on asphaltine or test rate content. And there are some links for additional resources related to especially for MSCR and ERDSR. And I need to acknowledge my funding agency for doing this research transit definitely. And then uh, RDOT and suppliers and also graduate assistants, uh, current and former. And then um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sahid. And uh, I'll quickly introduce our uh, last and, and third speaker, uh, and that is Dr. Amit Basin. Uh, Dr. Basin is Associate Professor of Civil Engineering and Director of the Center for Transportation Research at the University of Texas at, at Austin. <clears throat> His research and te teaching interests are in the area of infrastructure materials. He is currently serving as a President of the Academy of Pavement Science and Engineering. His research and teaching have been recognized through several different awards and honors, including the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Cutsy Art Award for Outstanding Contributions to Research and Teaching in Transportation, the University of Texas System Regents Outstanding Teaching Award, the University of Texas at Austin's uh, President's Associates Teaching Award, and the ASC Walter L. Huber Research Prize. Okay, I'll try to go through this very quickly. Thank you all for being the, here this afternoon on this webinar. and. Chris, uh, it takes a lot of effort to organize these things. So I really appreciate that and having the opportunity to speak here. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is not a specific project or uh, results from one specific study, but a bigger idea and the idea that has evolved through several different studies. Uh, sort of my overview here is very scant because I'm going to stick to some, some highlights here. So you've seen this, uh, this idea before that we have several different distresses that we think about or worry about in terms of material design. And when you're looking at materials, you're looking at the components, the binder, aggregate, and then you're looking at mixture design, which is gradation and binder content. And when you tie back to these distresses, you have contributions, the quality of binder or aggregate gradation, binder content, they have different impact, very high impact to some cases, less impact uh, and so forth. And you'll see earlier today, we, you just heard about moisture damage, which is tied together because that's neither a binder problem, not an aggregate problem, but something tied together. Anyway, you've seen this theme a couple of times now. I'm gonna stick to uh, binder. But just as an important takeaway here when we talk about binder, one thing to remember is that the performance of the binder or bitumen is critical but not sufficient to ensure payment performance. So it is one component. Uh, if, if you start with a poor quality binder that does not meet the requirements for that traffic and environment, you're unlikely to get a good mix. But just because you have a good quality binder does not guarantee a good mix. So we'll focus on binder and specifically I'll focus this afternoon very, you know, just to keep things moving, focus on fatigue cracking uh, more than other distresses. And you heard a little bit about rotting earlier and moisture damage earlier. So the thing about binders is that there are a number of different, there I call these challenges and opportunities because as the bitumen is produced in an oil refinery, there are a number of modifiers and extenders. There are processes that influence the binder chemistry, which in turn influence the rheology, tensile strength, and properties of the binder. The chemical additives, polymers, elastomers, plastomers, combinations of different chemical and plastomer, elastomers, and so forth. Then there are binder extenders, refining products are 
one class of extenders and many other, there are many other types of extenders that are used. And then it doesn't end there. This is, this is what you get. The first box that you see is what comes out of the binder terminal. And then when it goes to the hot mix plant, there are again things that modify or affect the binder chemistry. Uh, at a very fundamental level. You may use anti-strip agents, you may use recycling agents, you may use a warm mix agents, you may use extenders like the wrap. Here. All of these things, when you look at it, there are a number of moving parts here, a number of different combinations that are possible. And each combination will have some effect on the chemical composition of the bitumen, which in turn will affect its performance. And after you're done producing and placing your mix in the field, uh, then there's natural uh, processes like aging that is happening, and that also affects the chemistry, rheology, and so forth. So all of these things are, are quite well understood in our community. The point that I'm trying to make here is that it is very difficult to, if we try to focus on one aspect of the you know, change or modify or extender, um, if we try to focus on any one of these slices, then we miss the bigger picture. And as a community, I think we all ought to try to be focused more on the end goal. As engineers, what do I care? I care about the performance. I care about whether this material can withstand stresses or not, whether this material can withstand environment, uh, or the environment in which it's going to put the, be put out there or not. So those are the things we ought to care about. And once you do that, you ought to be measuring really the performance, or you should have what I call as, uh, uh, as, as these robust performance metrics. So we have the performance grade system or the PG system, but it is, all of us recognize that it's a little bit out of date and given that we have so many moving parts, now we ought to revisit that and find out performance metrics that are really performance indicators and are more robust. But I'd also like to emphasize that these kind of, whatever we develop should be based on fundamental mechanisms of failure. Uh, we ought to focus on how failure happens and use that knowledge to, to come up with the test method or metrics. Tied to that is once we understand how things fail, what are the fundamental mechanisms of failure, we can also use that to design new binders, to design or optimize like what polymer with what chemical, with what wrap can I optimize or how can I make this, how can I turn the gears here to, to produce a binder that really meets certain requirements. And that's why I think this is both challenging and it's also an opportunity because if you have a better understanding of how these things interact uh, and a good robust measure of performance at the end of the day, we can also go in reverse and say, look, I'm not just looking at what happens when I mix X with Y and Z, but also that if I want a certain level of performance, can I go back and say, this is the optimal combina combination of things that I need to, to look at to achieve that performance. So let's look, at, uh, uh, let's look at the fundamental mechanisms and understanding to how do we use this to design a, a robust method to measure. So to, to to design a robust performance measure, we, we ought to start by asking, like, what is it when you, if I'm looking at cracking particularly here, uh, what is it that, uh, what is it that I'm concerned about? What is, what is cracking in an asphalt mix? What is the stress state experienced by the binder in an asphalt mix? And how does, how, what is fatigue cracking? Where does this fatigue cracking come from? How does it start? And then, if I have that understanding, how can I do something in a lab that captures that essence of fatigue cracking, both nucleation and growth? So we ought to start with the bigger question and understand what is the stress state experienced by the binder? How does damage start? And then, then figure out how do I create something in the lab that sort of mimics the mechanism not necessarily mimicking the asphalt mixture, but mimicking the mechanism, creating the same kind of situation and stresses and stress states uh, to, to replicate the mechanisms, the fundamental mechanisms of failure. So let's look at the fundamental mechanisms of failure. This is a very simple finite element analysis. What we have is a very typical pavement structures, your base, sub base uh, with an asphalt layer. You can put a tire footprint here, you can analyze for stresses, but now, you want to look at this from a more, this is at a continuum scale, you want to look at it a little bit more closely. So you can take different kinds of asphalt mixtures, you can get a CT scan, you can take that scan and you can examine what is the microstructure of the mix. And you can zoom in a little bit and examine that in this portion where you have this mastic here, 
what are the kind of stresses that the binder experiences? You can, in fact, zoom in further and look at the mastic and resolve it to that. Level. But the question here is, what is the binder experiencing in a real mix, in a real pavement? You don't need the exact numbers for every single pavement combination, but just an idea of the three-dimensional state of stress that the binder experiences. And, and what we find here is that, before we go to the next slide, what you find here is that the binder experiences a very high degree of confinement. Keep in mind, you have a very thin film between very stiff materials here, so it experiences a very high degree of confinement. Let's look at what happens when you have changed stress state. So here are two different failure mechanisms. Both of these pictures, you see something that is about uh, 12 millimeter in diameter. And this to the left is a stress state where you have a very confined film of the bitumen. The bitumen is experiencing very high stress state, very high degrees of confinement, similar to what it experiences in an asphalt mix. On the right side is what you have a bitumen that does not experience the same degree of confinement as it experiences in a big in a in a film in the asphalt mixture. It is more uh, it, it has more degrees of freedom is not confined the same way it is confined in the mix. So look at the failure mechanism. This failure on the left side is what is more realistic and what is referred to as cavitation. These are actually uh, a failed surface, and what you see is cavitation. This, this is what how cracks are born and how they grow. Uh, on the right side, though, is when you have a thick film or film at high temperatures, a thick film that does not confine the same way as a film is confined or as a bitumen experiences in the asphalt mix, you get a very different phenomena. In physics, this is referred to as the fingering effect because of the nature of these, uh, these fingers that are formed as you, as you apply tension or other forms of distress. So these are very different failure mechanisms. You would expect this kind of failure only when you have very high binder contents, which is not typical of most, most mixes. This is what you would expect in, in most typical mixes. So again, if you look at the failure mechanism here, this just shows uh, on the x-axis you've got aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio basically is telling you how much confinement you get. Uh, lower the aspect ratio, less is the confinement. Higher aspect ratio is more confinement. This is more realistic here. Uh, this is more realistic here uh, than than, than this one in a real mix. So, and what you'd see is that the tensile stresses and failure mode changes. So you transition from what is referred to as flow into what is referred to as fracture or cavitation or nucleation. And, and the state of stress completely dictates how your material is going to evolve. Moral of the story here is that when we are testing things in the lab and we want to capture how it fails in the field, we ought to start by thinking about what is the material experiencing in the lab. The other thing is uh, the bitumen, where do these cracks originate from? So this is, this is a picture of the bulk of the bitumen showing cracking originating within the asphalt binder. This is a monotonic loading. Let's look at this picture. Uh, uh, this one is fatigue loading. So you see this is a time-lapse video of a number of, this is thousands of fatigue cycles being applied. You can see here these cracks forming and propagating uh, right at this point, and they're connecting with other uh, other sites and other nucleation sites. So, and what you see here is a bulk. Uh, so this this has been captured using with some of my colleagues in the Department of Physics using certain optical techniques that are able to see in the bulk of the binder. So you're not seeing anything at the interface. This is this is happening in the bulk of the binder. But the cavities that you saw earlier, they're born here, they're growing here, and they're forming into these micro cracks that connect with other micro cracks, and then uh, they result in failure. So this is this is where cracks are born, and this is how they grow. Honestly, I've driven, drawn pictures and cartoons of these kind of cracks for many years, but uh, we're, we're now at a stage where we're able to visually see, track, and measure the crack, uh, these crack holes. By the way, just to give you an idea, uh, this thing is, is, a, uh, is about 100 micrometers or so in, in width. So you're really looking at really, really small micro cracks there uh, in, the, in the micrometer lens. So uh, moving forward, what do we do in terms of test? How do we take this... Um, uh, and, and capture it in a test method and so forth. So this is, uh, you know, please forgive me for being overly simplistic here. Uh, I know you're all familiar with something like this. I'm trying to oversimplify something that's a little bit more complicated, but, uh, but please uh, uh, bear with me for a little bit. This is a stress strain curve, simple stress strain curve for steel. Most of our binder testing that we do today 
The first problem that we have is that if you look at traditional tests, we are running them here. We're not pushing the material to failure. We're running them in, in a region where we actually don't push the material to failure. Now, the multiple stress creep recovery test, I think, is getting a little bit better because it takes it from this region to somewhere in that region. So it is somewhat an improvement over the earlier G star over sine delta version of binder rutting. The second problem here is that if you test for fatigue cracking uh, in, an, in an asphalt binder using a DSR, if you use a thick film, the failure mode that you get is going to be very different. A thick film, a two millimeter or one millimeter thick film between two steel plates is not really what the binder experiences in the asphalt mix. So we, we actually are not capturing the real failure mechanism of the material uh, by using thick films. There may be, we may end up with a correlation, but that does not necessarily mean that's the most accurate correlation that we kind of hit or miss. So how do we fix this? One way to fix this is, uh, is using, uh, this is a reference here by uh, Dr. Motamed, uh, Rash Motamed here. Uh, he did some work early on uh, when he was at UT Austin. So one way to replicate this would be to use what we call as a standardized composite test. So this is an asphalt binder specimen, except that it has been turned into a composite using glass beads of different size. Why glass beads? Because they're standard. Uh, there's no interaction between uh, glass beads, or very little to no interaction between glass beads and bitumen. So you create a little composite sample. Why do you do this? Because when you create this composite sample, uh, you're, this is like a miniature mix. You, you recreate the confinement of the film in the binder as you ha as you see in the mix. So you're recreating that same stress state. And when you when you apply, when you recreate that stress state and subject it to some kind of a fatigue test, you see very different behavior. So for here, for example, here you have three different uh, or four different results from four different asphalt binders. Interestingly, all four binders have the exact same continuous grade within plus or minus half or one degree continuous grade. So they are very similar in their high, low, intermediate temperature grade within a degree of each other, all four binders. In fact, all four binders have the same crude source, same base source. Uh, they're just different modifiers. So you can see that depending on the modifier, even with the same grade, you get very different fatigue life. You, you know, one of these modifiers shows very little fatigue life. The other one shows extremely high fatigue life. Uh, in fact, this test was stopped. We didn't even wait for this test to finish. So... Uh, and, and if you look at binder grading, go, which goes back to, to testing uh, things here in this region, if you look at binder grading and you're, you're here in this region, you're not capturing at what point it fails. So you can have a binder that goes all the way here and then fails like this, or it could fail like that or something like that. So and that is why using you know, the right stress state and also uh, using the proper uh, or trying to simulate the proper mechanisms is very important. So this just shows the same binder grade with different fatigue lines. Uh, by the way, when these tests were run by some others on full asphalt mixtures, this is the same trend that they would see with the full asphalt mixture performance. It was very good correlation over there. Another way to do this, now we realize this may be a little bit cumbersome here. You'd have to get glass beads. You have to mix it, uh, prepare this for sample. It takes a little bit of time. So uh, another way to achieve this binder testing is using what is called as a poker chip test. In fact, this idea existed even in 1960s and 70s. Uh, Merrick and Helen did some very early research work on this. Uh, somehow, I don't know why, whatever reason it is, it did not stick in the binder industry. Part of that also has to do with technological evolution, the instrumentation quality, data acquisition systems, the precision with which we could manufacture samples and test samples was not the same as we have today. So the poker chip test, and this by the way is also used in aerospace engineering and mechanics to, to uh, evaluate adhesives of several different kinds to measure both cohesive uh, properties and adhesive properties. Uh, earlier today you must have seen the, the the BBS or the, or the PADI test or the pull-off test, which is kind of uh, similar, except that this is done in a little bit more controlled environment. The point here is that the test here, one, there are two characteristics. Here, one, you create a confined film that replicates the same stress state as a real asphalt mixture. And the second thing is you apply a tensile test and push it until failure. And you get, you know, you can measure tensile strength, fracture energy, so forth. Again, just as an example to show you here, these four binders, are all rated with very similar, not just PG64, they also have very similar continuous grades, but you can see that tensile strength can be can vary 
by almost a factor of two if you compare these two binders. And the current specs say both are similar, but you can clearly see the tensile strength is very, very different. The same thing when you look at a group of PG70 minus 20 binders, you can see huge differences in their tensile strength. This is very similar to what we saw in the previous slide. You know, you can you can get look at these fatigue lives, you get very different fatigue lives. And you can compare results from the poker chip with the with the overlay tester, uh, different parameters from the overlay tester, tester, and so forth. So anyway, just to quickly recap, the most important thing is we have to understand that the bitumen experiences a very different stress state in an asphalt mixture because it is confined by aggregate particles. The way you test bitumen in a lab must be reflective of that same level of stress, the same stress state, the same three-dimensional stress state that it experiences in an asphalt mix. Two, uh, we have to make sure we push the material to damage and understand how damage is nucleating and forming. And, and a clear example of that is, is cavitation, crack nucleation, and, and growth. Uh, third is obviously we have to take all of this and capture it in some form or shape to uh, to make it more practical and, and ready for use on a routine basis. Last, I just want to mention this very briefly, is that all of this knowledge, all of this fundamental understanding is there are two sides to this coin. One is turning this into a tool for purchase specification, for quality assurance and quality control. Um, but the other side of this coin is also to use this as a tool to to design better binders, to understand that can we engineer binders and can we uh, understand the link between the chemistry and mechanics of binders. And, uh, and once we do that, we can, we can move these dials as we want uh, and, and adjust the binder design uh, to meet specific requirements. And this is sort of just an idea. Uh, we're developing what we call as a, as a library of material properties. We have properties, including the SATA fraction, solubility. We have over 100 binders in this library right now, uh, looking at the external structure, internal structure, um, the tensile strength rheology, and, and tied with, with specific models that explain this behavior. Anyway, I think this is the last slide I have. And with that, I'll, I'll acknowledge my uh, colleagues, friends, graduate students, former graduate students, and sponsors, uh, Texas Department of Transportation and NSF. Um, and, and a lot of time invested by graduate students who've, who've gone above and beyond their project uh, charge to, to explore these things and my collaboration with colleagues in physics. Um, but, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Amit. That was a great uh, presentation. If anyone does have a couple of questions to all the panelists, I'll unmute all the panelists. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you if you do have a question that you can uh, speak on air. I will, I have recorded this webinar and I will post it on Transit's website um, probably in, in, in next week sometime. Uh, so you could also have that as a reference you can go back to and watch uh, the video. And again, I'll pop, oh, here's a QA. and I think here's a question, which I'll just uh, read. Uh, uh, in fatigue tests with high numbers of load cycling, self-heating is one of the factors that has an impact on viscoelastic parameters. How this phenomenon can be distinguished in fatigue tests like LAS? And honestly, I'm not sure who that's directed to, but if any of the panelists can answer that question. Can you still hear me, Chris? Yes. Yeah, I can take a shot. Yes, um, there is... Um, there is there's clearly an effect of temperature, and and if you put a if you stick a thermocouple in a in a sample, uh, you you can measure it. In fact, this effect exists even in asphalt mixtures. Now the thing, another thing about the LAS test versus when you use thin films, is that thin films are more thermodynamically stable, uh, or or uh, take less effort for for thermodynamic to achieve the similar temperature conditions whereas thicker films take a longer time. So again, by going to thin confined films, you actually shoot two birds with the same arrow uh, in the sense that you not only create the right stress state, but you also create a test temperature or a testing situation in which it, the, the specimen is, is more readily, or more readily achieves that temperature. Now, uh, we have actually measured 
but even with thick films, I must admit that the, the, the difference, particularly just with the binder, is there, but it's not very significant. I forget the numbers, but we actually did the math on this and, and, and did some calculation on how much percentage softening you get or stiffness loss you get purely because of heating. But it's possible to measure it. It's possible to actually stick a thermocouple and measure it. It's not very significant even with thick films, in, in my opinion, not just opinion, but in the, in the tests that we have done and some of the calculations we have run afterwards. Perfect. Uh, thank you for Amit for answering that question. Uh, yeah, first I definitely want to thank our three pres presenters. Um, thank you very much, and also want to thank the attendees. And again, um, the video recording will be on our website, and I can also email that link to everybody, likely uh, middle of next week. Um, so yeah, again, thank you very much for attending, and have a great rest of the day.